Well, welcome everyone back to DoorCast episode six. For those of you that have been following me and my trails and tribulations as I wander around the country staying at a Holiday Inn Express, I'm finally back with another episode. Um, I realize it's been a while. Hopefully y'all haven't been too worried about me. Um, I have been very busy and I haven't frankly had a whole lot of stories to tell which kind of fits into today's episode, which I would kind of call tell the story. I'm not talking about telling your parents fibs when you were out about spending the night at friends' houses and you were really hanging out with friends. I'm talking about letting your data tell the story. Um, I think most of you know my background. I've worked with data for a long time when it comes to storytelling. I did stay at a Holiday Inn Express lately. And so um, just like Cole Naflack or Stephanie Evergreen um, or my guest today, I can kind of consider myself an expert in storytelling. My guest is David Chomo, who is the Data Visualization Principal at the Visualization Center of Excellence at Humana. Now, if that title seems pretty exciting, I thought it was as well, which is kind of why I have him on a guest. David, tell me a little bit about your background and how you ended up in this role, because I've heard of centers of excellence when it comes to data and coding and things like that. Um, this is kind of a unique thing. I haven't seen this a whole lot. So tell me a little bit about how you got to be in this position. Yeah, sure. First and foremost, uh, thanks for having me on. Uh, this is super exciting for me, too. So, um, you know, it, it's been a unique journey for me. Uh, 20 plus years ago, uh, I, I, I went to art school to be an illustrator. I wanted to actually be a Disney animator. So my training in the fundamental principles of traditional art kind of propelled me into actually a career of graphic design. After school, I went up to the Discovery Channel in D.C. Um, and worked on some wonderful ad campaigns and was part of the Internal Creative Services Department. But as a graphic designer and illustrator and traditional artist uh, by trade, our job is to tell visual stories, whether it be conceptual, whether it be uh, taking uh, corporate marketing, advertising, communication content, uh, somebody's brand or what they do, and coming up with a visual way to represent and tell their story. Uh, about five years ago, I moved to Kentucky and was looking for work as a designer, as an art director, and uh, ended up applying actually to this position at Humana for a data visualization specialist. I actually am coming into this role or had come into this role with zero background in data or analytics, even though it was an IT specific role. And, um, and, and the gentleman who hired me, my director at the time, had told me it, it's okay what I'm looking to you for is to tell visual stories. The only difference is instead of using communication material or advertising information or corporate information, I'm looking for you to tell stories with data. Uh, that was a new concept for me. So I had to find my feet. And within about six months, we started to kind of find where that sweet spot is. Um, I had to get up on understanding data and analytics very, very quickly because that is our sub area within IT. And once I, once I kind of got up and running there, um, I started to kind of understand where I could piece the visualizations together. And so the role really developed out of data visualization specifically and turned more into a role of kind of a, a UI, UX designer uh, slash data visualization slash visual storyteller. Um, that then projected us into, uh, well, I'll backtrack for a moment and just say that we got so busy doing project work uh, with our business partners and our, in our internal IT partners, uh, creating dashboards, digital reports, and applications, that I was getting the same phone calls daily and I was getting the same emails daily. How can we leverage your information? Where can I get this? How, you know, do you have this written down that we could uh, look for it or, or, or download it? Uh, and that was on a variety of topics, whether that be color theory or design layout or how do I tell a visual story. So uh, I was tasked with creating the Visual Center of Excellence. The VCOE is a unique product for 
Humana as a whole. We have, like you mentioned, we, we internally have a lot of center of excellences, digital center of excellence, uh, the digital experience center, which is its own center of excellence. And then we have center of excellences within our BI platforms as well. Uh, we even have a click sense COE. So when the, the task of creating the, C, the COE came in front of me, it was really more about saying what information could I put out there that people could leverage, that people could download without having to transfer all 20 plus years of knowledge and experience, uh, what are those things that could be meaningful? And so we went through that journey and process. We launched uh, the VCOE just about two years ago now. Uh, we get a tremendous amount of traffic to the site that has projected me into doing uh, what we call ITLS classes, IT learning services classes on a variety of topics. Uh, I also do uh, computer-based training classes, and then I do a lot of lectures as well. Uh, the most recent was at the analytics conference that Humana sponsors every year. So really, at the end of the day, what we're looking at is a progressive journey. Um, but it's all rooted fundamentally in the idea of how do I tell a story with, and you fill in the blank. In our case that we're talking about today and that I've been doing for the last couple of years, but that, that blank is data. Fantastic. That is really exciting stuff. And I know I'm going to want to come back um, at some point and talk about um, the marketing aspect of this because um, I think it fits in perfectly with what I'm about to share. What I wanted to do was spend a little, just a little bit of time setting users up for understanding what it is that you do different. Um, so the typic, typical analytics application development process I've seen um, in IT in my 34 years uh, in the industry um, has kind of been what I would call the cycle of doom, and I've actually presented the actual topic, the cycle of doom, <laughs> which really draws their interest because um, there's a story there. But here, here's the basic point. Somebody has a question in the business unit. Um, they go to IT and they, and they say, hey, I've got a question. I need an answer. And IT gathers some requirements. They begin coding. Um, and they spend what, what I would think is like a million cycles iterating through the, iterating through the front end design. Um, because they're, they, what they hear the user say is, I want these zeros and ones, and they say, okay, here's your zeros and ones, right? And they display 17 on the screen, and they're like, but that doesn't tell me anything. Like, that's just giving me the answer. Well, that's what you asked for. Your requirements were bad. Um, and this cycle goes on and on and on and on, and at the end of it, the great news is it sits on a shelf because it gets no adoption. Right? There was one user who, who did the asking, um, and I think it represents some, some real problems with assumptions. Um, my, my real problem with the whole process is the, developer, the, the thought that the developer should be able to do everything, that, that a developer who works with data should have 20 years' experience in graphic arts, fundamental principles of arts, knowing how to do ad campaigns, and marketing the product across the company. They know how to go surface data. It also has the assumption that a single user, although they may be a subject matter expert, has any clue what the application should look like. They know what they want, so they say, here's what I need, and I know you're the smart guy. You'll, just, you'll make it just come to life for me. Um, and that doesn't happen, so what ends up what does end up happening in my eyes is contention. I say, quit asking for stuff you're not going to use anyway, David. And you, as a business area guy, says, well, quit building stuff I can't use. Like, <laughs> like it's your fault. Right. right? And, and we end up going through this over and over and over, and it starts feeling like I'm just laying bricks. Like, why bother? So I start showing up late for work. I start leaving early. Um, and this stuff becomes very costly um, because my time isn't free, your time isn't free, the missed opportunities just are ridiculous in terms of the cost to companies. Either you take action on stuff that you don't have the data for, you're just going off your gut feel, um, or, or by the time I get it to you, we find out we could have saved a million dollars if you'd have had the data in your hands a month ago. 
Um, and I think the problem, it always comes down to people, process, and technology. And the process that IT loves is activity. I, I want to track activity. What percent am I done? And there's a lot of activity in this process, um, but very little action taken. And, and that's what I think I, I want you as a, as a, as a, a viewer viewing this um, to understand what, what David's going to be talking about is how you actually get action taken by presenting the data in a way that tells the story, gets people engaged, and wants them to move on. Yeah, I can so agree with David, you more. Yeah, one of the things that I talk about all the time um, is vision. And uh, I, I love clicks core values. When I started with Click three and a half years ago, um, I came in, I had, had a huge ego at the time. And when I started and I looked at our core values, I thought, oh, my God, I'm the weak link in the chain. Like, this is how people think, breathe, act, um, and this is the culture. And when I look at you guys' culture, core values, I see two that really resonate with me, um, which is rethink routine and pioneer simplicity. That's, that's kind of my motto is let's make it simple. Um, and I think this is hard because IT for so long, like I say, I think is focused on process um, and activity and tracking tracking things that they don't think about whether actions got taken at the end of it or not. We've measured, did I do 500 reports, not did anybody actually use those things. So um, I, unless I'm misunderstanding something, what you've really done um, with this team um, is to kind of take the risk to rethink that routine and pioneer a simplicity that gets the focus on the actions rather than the work. Is that kind of what you've done? Yeah, it's, you know, it's, it's funny because when I first started here and I saw these, I thought that they were wonderful, right? Each one of them uniquely and individually, uh, you can go in all different kinds of directions. And, I, and it's funny because it, you hit the nail on the head. These core values are promoted by our senior leadership daily, and it's, and it's integral in everybody's work, but there are, there are individuals in areas, especially within IT, that feel that they're exempt of certain ones, um, and, and it, it, it's just not, simply not true. Um, now, I'm going to backtrack, though, and just state one, one thing, which is, yes, these two absolutely 100% apply, and I have focused on those myself, but in a recent keynote lecture that I gave, um, I was kind of connecting the dots and I realized something without working very hard, we relate to all of the values. And, and it's simply stated by saying, um, we pioneer simplicity and cultivate uniqueness in how we tell our story. But it's the way of thinking also makes us rethink our routine and our approach, which, prom which promotes thriving together to communicate our mission of inspiring health to support Humana's bold goal mission, which is healthier communities, 20% healthier communities by 2020. So we actually, even though Rethink Routine and Pioneer Simplicity was, was our own foundation to say, how can we do this differently and better, I started to very quickly realize that we, we're embodying all of the values. Very neat, very neat. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for calling those things out. All right, I'm looking forward to seeing how, what, what you're going to share with us, David. Yeah, no, that's great. And and like I said, you know, this I think the concepts that we're applying, uh, that I've chosen to apply, the ones that I focus on primarily are agnostic. They're agnostic to the tool that you're using, even though uh, obviously, you know, we are a heavy click view, click sense user. Uh, they're agnostic to the data and the data sources. And they're agnostic to the problem because it isn't about what, what the issue is. It's about how do we communicate what the right story is to drive action. One of our biggest fundamental principles in addition to the core values that we follow is we are trying to provide meaningful insights and actionable opportunities for our senior leadership. Always having that in the back of our minds as we design, build, and create uh, the way that we, you know, our, our visualizations and our stories, having that in the back of the mind helps track us to that goal, uh, mainly, Dalton, to prevent what you had mentioned earlier, which is this, the, the cycle of doom. 
Um, we, we're very focused on being purposeful with our builds, with our design and builds, to make sure that we're not wasting time, we're not wasting money. That's part of the rethink routine, and it's also part, part of the pioneering simplicity. What you see on screen here is our landing page for the Visualization Center of Excellence. It kind of states our core mission, and it absolutely talks about some of the big questions that we usually get or ask. Um, the challenge that we have is that the primary user or visitor of this site are IT developers um, and IT partners. In addition to that, we've expressed this and, and promoted it enterprise-wide. So all of our business areas have access to this as well. Well, when you think about Humana, we have 24,000 people in our analytics community. These are people not just consuming information, but also creating. And that can be, again, dashboards, digital reports, regular reports, or applications. When you think about that many people, how do you reach that many people in the variety of scale? You have to keep things relatively generic. A lot of the I love talk. It. Oh yeah, yeah, please. Yeah, I, I, what I what I caught there that you said was you have twenty four thousand people in your analytics community. Mm -hmm. um, you guys really have transitioned um, not just from a marketing speak, um, but to everybody believing that that analytics are 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 the base of what you guys do um, because you Absolutely. don't have twenty four thousand developers. <laughs> You've no. got. 24,000 employees, all of which you believe are consuming analytics. And that is half of our total associate population. So we are very, very focused on trying to better understand and drive Humana's business from an analytical perspective. Um, it isn't just stabs in the dark. We, we, we have... You know, there was, there was a statement made at a town hall from our president and CEO, Bruce Bessard. He said, we already have too much data at Humana, but we have to get smarter about what we do with it and how we consume it. And so it's put everybody in this very focused approach. A lot of the talks and lectures that I give, as you can see, a, a few of the screenshots of, of the uh, opening slides on the screen here, the word data visualization is ever present because I feel like it's a draw. It draws people in because a lot of folks don't have that skill set, as you mentioned before. They know how to build something, but they don't understand how to tell that visual story. But as I go into any of these decks, it's not really about specific, the, the specific um, skill of data visualization or the information around data visualization. It always comes back to visual storytelling. Awesome. Uh, I think those titles are, are pretty neat. Those must uh, be a good draw for people. You have to market and sell your own work and product to make people interested. People aren't going to just show up if you say, I'm going to teach you something cool about data visualization. So again, years in the communication, marketing, and advertising world as a, you know, kind of as, as a designer and art director, um, I've found ways to kind of tease people into coming. I always equate it to creating a movie. You have to create your movie trailer first, and then once you draw people into the, the seats, into the theater, then the movie could be as good or as crappy as you want. doesn't matter. You got them in the seats. <laughs> so. Yeah, and that's what I like about your background is marketing, because I think that's one of the things, as, as, I, as I travel to many, many companies, there's just the assumption. You asked me to build whatever the app is, obviously you're going to have everybody use it, right? Yeah. Um, and this is where I, I think that developers um, really miss the game. Um, mm -hmm. They don't have any marketing skills. They don't want to research anything about marketing. And then they upset, they're upset and they have a, a really low morale that things aren't adopted. Yes. If you're out there and you really, really want to drive user adoption, I think you've got to consider the marketing aspect of this. So this is something um, that I know we really work on trying to help organizations with, mm -hmm. um, not just the humanities of the world, any organization. Right. Call and let us help you figure out how to market what you're doing 
um, because we want your work to be adopted. You've worked hard on it. Um, so let's go ahead and keep going here because I'm, I'm excited to see how you transition from data to the story part of it. Absolutely. So the fundamental truth is that the brain is the most complicated three-pound piece of hardware we know. In its simplest form, we have five traditional senses, taste, smell, touch, hearing, and sight. The stimuli from each sensing organ in the body is relayed to different parts of the brain, just kind of fundamental anatomy. Sensory information is transmitted from the peripheral nervous system to the central nervous system. That system you know, receives most of the sensory signals, passes them along to the appropriate area of the cerebral cortex. The cerebral cortex is essentially connects to our visual cortex, otherwise known as the optical lobe. But the reason why I give you that little anatomy lesson is because 90% of all information is consumed visually. 70% of all sensory perceptions are in the eyes, and 30% of the brain's processing power is dedicated to sight. I just want to put that last number in perspective. 30% compared to only 8% touch and 3% hearing. So what this means is that we see, record, process, interpret, and react by our sight more than any other sense. So going from there, knowing that that is just fundamentally how we as human beings work, 40,000 years ago, our visual storytelling started with essentially cave paintings. Those paintings were intended to tell our story. They were very purposeful. It wasn't like people were just experimenting with quote unquote art. They were telling stories of their daily life, of their, of their hunting and gathering, of their kills, of their family. It was a way in its simplest form before the written language and spoken word, a way to tell our stories. Throughout the centuries, that communication of visual storytelling continued, but the challenge is, is that as the written word and the spoken language started to develop, not everybody was uh, able to consume information that way. So we see this transition into what ended up being called art, but it was a way to tell very complex stories as we kind of became more sophisticated in ultimately a simple way. The great thing about certain periods of art was that we have this sense of interpretation. So even though the artist may intend one story, the viewer and consumer can gather another. That's going to play a factor in a moment here. In today's world, with social media and technology, our processing power has gotten so compressed. On average, we, have an on we only have an attention span of somewhere in the neighborhood about 3.2 seconds. You think about that when it comes to an app on your phone. You download that app. It's not working for you. Something's wrong with it. You delete it. We have been bred as a culture of impatience. So the challenge is that we have all this information out there being squeezed into this tiny little three pound piece of hardware, which is our brain, and we have to prioritize what we consume, what we choose to care about, what we walk away with, what we remember. And knowing that, we now make decisions based on that. This is a fundamental thing that most people don't comprehend. They put what on, everything on a page, I call that kind of information dumping. They just say, here you go, there it is, there's the data. They hope that the consumer is going to understand it, that they're going to find what they want in it, and that they're going to be happy. And exactly what you said ends up being the, the, the case. The consumer looks at it and is like, I don't know what I'm looking at here. This is hard to use. It's hard to navigate. They log out of it. They never log back into it. Before I started here, we had over a thousand dashboards and applications in Humana. Half of them weren't being used. Half of them hadn't been logged into in years. And the owners of those tools are wondering why their product isn't being used it's because it was an overwhelming experience. And that's where the UI, the user interface, and the UX, the user experience design comes into play. Because it isn't just about getting your information out there. You're not just publishing a scientific report. 
you are having to take what you with, with the core stuff. I equate it to being clay on a table. You're putting all your clay on a table. Having somebody come and view the clay on the table does nothing. You have to sculpt something out of that clay that people can relate to, that people care about. You have to find ways to make people care. So I'd like to just briefly walk everyone through what you and I have already discussed, um, but in a Humana context, and it's very reminiscent of what you said. Traditionally speaking, in the IT world, we have data. We know where the data is. It's wonderful data. It's curated, it's cleaned, it's scrubbed, et cetera. We pick a tool or a platform. We're going to just say click view. I don't, you know, just random example. <laughs> but we, we take the tool and we, we ingest the data into the tool. We kind of fumble through some of the cool visualizations that ClickView has in stock, um, not knowing really what the right visual is to tell the story, but we're just picking something that looks cool. We apply colors. And through that tremendously long, torturous process, which could take months and months and months and months because you have to go through cycles of reviews with your business partners, you eventually stumble across a story that you think the business wants to tell, business thinks that what they want to tell, and then it gets out there, millions of dollars have been spent, and the business ends up coming to you back six months later and saying, we have to rebuild this or we have to redesign it because it's not what we want. It's not, it's not you know, people can't use it. It's not great. The other scenario is, is that we have a tool. We have a lot of business partners who say, I only know ClickView, so I have to build in ClickView. They have blinders on. Then they go get their data, or they have IT go get their data. And then during that process of putting the data in the tool, they kind of move things around and they spend months of iterating through uh, revisions, trying to figure out what they're trying to say with it. And then they find the way to visualize it. Um, and nine times out of 10, the visualizations are not the appropriate visualizations to tell the story. That's when I see we get these dashboards that have just a ton of bar charts on it. And then underneath each bar chart, there's a table of the exact same data set because they feel that the, you need to be redundant in order to be clear. And then on top of that, they put this huge paragraph in an exploratory paragraph right next to it to say what all of this means and why you should care. And it's just this overwhelming amount of information on the screen. What we suggest and what we kind of coach on and the way we implement it ourselves is that we start with a story. Again, stay data and tool agnostic for now. Think about what your data is and, and, and kind of like, you know, from a categorical perspective, we're dealing with member data. And our story is that we're, we'd like to uh, let a senior leader know that our membership numbers are up and that people are happy with our service. Generic example. But you want to focus on the story. Then from there, you want to find the data that supports that story. In this VIN diagram, it's actually somewhat accurate because a lot of times I find that we have three quarters of the data to support the story. And out of that quarter of data that doesn't support the story, or a third of the data that doesn't support the story, people just give up. They say, well, we don't have the data, so we'll just move on. No, if it's the right story, and that is what you want to communicate, you go find that data. Back to Bruce's point, we have so much data here. We have too much data here. So you just got to be smart about how you use it. Then we find the right way to visualize it. In other words, finding the right charts and the right communication within the UI and design of the page that helps support the right visualizations for the data that help support the story. Then we pick the platform. Now, in an ideal world, this is how the process works, but it's usually not true. When I'm on a project, I'm usually working with an IT delivery team, which is a bunch of developers and programmers. The first question out of the mind is, how are we going to build this and where's the data going to come from? As I'm shepherding the business partner through the story process, I'm in a, in a kind of a parallel path. I'm working with the IT dev team to say, well, what do you guys want to build in? What's going to be the most efficient cost-wise for the business partner, et cetera, et cetera? 
that way we're on the same page. And when I, as I'm developing the story and I'm developing the visuals, I have in the back of my mind the tool that we're going to build and where the data is going to come from. But I don't expose that to the business partner because I've discovered in, in the past that when they get bogged down with the data and the data sources and they get bogged down with the tool, they lock themselves into that. And they don't, they don't feel the creative freedom to think broader. So I take on that burden of, of weighing the options for them. But as I design my visual mock-ups that are going to show them what this product is going to look and feel like, I'm designing it with what the development team is going to do in mind. It's the first time in Humana IT that there is that middleman bridging that gap between the development team and the business partner. In the past, the development team, and you hit it right on the head earlier, the development team leads the project. They work directly with the business partner, and it's, it's a setup for failure because the business partner ends up art directing, the IT team ends up telling the business partner no, and then when the business partner gets upset, the IT team just says yes, and then they build whatever the, bus the business partner wants, and then everybody wonders why it fails. So I can't express to you how much you, you've got it, you understand it, you've seen it in your career over and over again. This is not unique to Humana or any one given company. This is rampant within the industry. So like I uh, mentioned, you know, we really find that way to bridge that gap and to kind of make sure that the project as a whole not only stays on track and is a good project uh, in the end, but it actually meets all the needs that it needs to meet. Can you, can you come back to your Venn diagram there? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, there was something I wanted. When you said you play with the visas, you're not. I, I want to make sure everybody understands. You're not in a tool playing with charts, looking at 500 property pages. You're <laughs> drawing stuff out by hand, kind of literally storyboarding it and saying this is what it should look like. I am. Um, because you've just drawn it. You, you've used that art background to just kind of draw the story. Um, I, I happen to love that. I, I love that approach. Yeah. Um, because as a developer, I, I'm I'm kind of somewhere in the middle ground, but a lot of developers don't like white screens. I mean, that's the hardest thing for us is to fill a white page, right? It's like, oh, my God, give me three inches. I put one, one visual there, and I could get one right, but trying to put them together. Um, so, I so I love that concept. Um, one of the things, though, I, I could imagine – um, and, and I want your take on it. Um, this is different. This is absolutely different. And what I know about business community is they're looking for fast, mm -hmm. right? And they're saying, well, geez, now I've got access to the developer. I just want it done. I would imagine that there's <laughs> right. a little reluctance on their point. Like, what do you mean, David? Dude, I ain't got time for you to be drawing this out because I just need – all I really need is this guy to just get the data, and from the developer standpoint, he's thinking, look, I've got a bar chart and a pie chart, and that's what I know what to do with. Why are you drawing the Skittles graph out there for me that I don't know for sure how I'm going to implement? So, Is there a little bit of resistance from yeah, both absolutely. parties? Absolutely. It's like anything else. What we don't know we're afraid of. And the concern is, is that, you know, and, and it took me a good six months to implement this on a project by project basis before people started to get it. And then that gave me leverage to promote it and to talk about it and to coach on it. People are skeptical by nature. It's just kind of who we are. And so it is. Business partners feel like we're dragging the process out and the project out, and it's going to cost more money. Um, the IT team is thinking we're on deadline and we don't have time for this. And then, yeah, from a visualization perspective, they're like, you're going to throw something really crazy at me that I'm not going to know how to build. So one by one, we convince the business partner actually that this is going to speed up the process because if we work through the story ahead of time and we sketch it and mock it up, we can iterate through that process a lot faster than a developer can inside of a tool. It's just a simple fact. So we can get through five or six versions of a concept in the course of a week, where it would take a development team, not only is the de development process a lot more expensive than my process, 
in the context of how IP charges, but it, it's just faster and I can work with them. Plus, I'm keeping them focused on what the story is and the message. Because the business partners have input through that entire process, they feel very comfortable. They feel a certain amount of ownership. And I ask the right questions up front rather than letting those questions come six months down the line when they see something for the first time. I get the development team at rest because I say, guys, listen, this is not only going to go faster this way, but I'm also going to work with you and I'm going to give you heads up along the way so you can start building behind the scenes. And whatever you think, you're going to get the first view of these mock-ups before the business partner. So if there are any tr you know, uh, issues, if there are any challenges, if you don't think you can do it, you can let me know ahead of time. And if I push back and I say this is what it has to be, then they have enough time to go research on how to build it. So it puts their minds at rest. So that everybody, it's, it's part politics, it's part shepherding the project in the right way. Now, granted, we have, pro, we have program managers and we have project managers, but they're focused on the logistics of keeping a project on, ta on track. They're not there to kind of serve that uh, center point of the, of the balance beam uh, or the seesaw between business and IT. Um, what we have discovered by following this process, and again, it's a simple fact, we have gone from projects that would take somewhere in the neighborhood of 14 to 18 months to develop an application or a dashboard to put it out there, and we've gotten that down in most cases to anywhere from two months to six months at the most. We have actually produced dashboards in eight weeks by following this process. And those would have been impossible to do if we followed the traditional IT development process. That, that's fantastic. Um, I love that and I think um, for those of you out there, you've got to consider those things. Um, I, I listened to a podcast yesterday on analytics in the casino um, and, and one of the things that um, a lot of uh, you know, wait staff thought when they started using technology for mobile ordering was, hey man, that's gonna replace me. Um, well, what the, the truth was, hey, now you get a whole lot more drinks to deliver yeah. uh, because you're not wasting time capturing the drink orders and you make a whole lot more tips because you're dr delivering more drinks and the customer's happier. Um, but it's that initial, it, you know, it's that initial thing you're gonna have to fight with. Um, and uh, like David said, despite 20 years in the industry uh, as a viz guru and a marketing guy and a UI UX master, um, he still had to fight those same things until he got a couple of success stories. And I'd imagine now you have to use those people to market to other people. Um, but I'm, I'm assuming you've got some data collected. Hey, here's the dollars we've saved. Look. You want quick activity. You want to say, I'm having a meeting, I'm starting to collect data um, so that you can show that you're underway with the project. Yes. Sometimes you need to slow that down a little bit to get to the end faster. Um, well, so let's and, go ahead and move on. I know, you've got, I know you've got so much more. But go ahead and finish, <laughs> but yeah, I know I your next slide was about action. Yeah, so, you know, it, it, really, it really comes down to the fact that um, – you know, we have to keep people focused on the end goal. And by keeping it organized in a fashion similar to this, what you do is you keep people focused on, again, that kind of anatomy of how we consume information. People don't consume information necessarily by data points, not the business user. They don't consume, they don't care what it's built in. They don't care necessarily even that uh, that the data is, well, I mean, I guess they care that the data is inaccurate or accurate, but ultimately what they care about most is that story visualization combination. Because if they can look at something in just those 3.2 seconds that I mentioned earlier, they get what that graphic is trying to say, and it's accurate, and it's meaningful, and it's insightful, and it's actionable, that's all they care about. And I think we get so wrapped up in the build and the technical aspect of things so I, I just I continue to coach people to just take a step back, take a breath, look at it real quick. That's what artists do. 
even in its meme fashion, when you see an artist painting at a canvas and then they step back and they look at it and they put their thumb up looking at it measurement-wise and then they go back and paint, that's an actual technique. It's saying sometimes when you get so close to the details, you can't see the big picture. Take a step back, look at it with fresh eyes, look at it at its entirety, and then go back in and correct. So leadership defined, and Humana leadership, I'll define that, uh, define success or successful decision-making by the ability to turn insights into action. I mentioned that earlier. And the fundamental goal of a great story is, or through data visualization is impact. Data visualization is a mean or to the end result, okay? It's a way that you get there. It isn't an end-all, be-all. It's just a way that it's part of that journey. We must engage the consumer. We talked about that um, almost to nauseam, but we could certainly talk about that more. Uh, we, we removed out and clarified decisions, and I think that that's critical, okay? It isn't about putting all of my data on screen. It's about picking and choosing, being selective with the data to support the story that will help remove the doubt around the data or the information that you're trying to communicate and it clarifies those decisions. It absolutely has to be meaningful, it has to reveal the truth, and it has to deliver insight. If you find, if you do that kind of evaluation of your information and your story, and it doesn't do that, it just feels like a bunch of information, rethink it. Use what you have in, in your brain to tell you this is really important or it's not. Um, it, and the actionable opportunity thing, why are we building dashboards just to have a so what reaction? We have to have an aha reaction. We have to have a, a moment of inspiration and realization to say, whoa, that's, that's really dipping. Before that dips any further, we got to go after that. We got to fix that. You need those actionable opportunities. The demo that I give, and I know Dalton, you've seen this before, but I think it's, it's really simple and really meaningful. Um, how many times have we seen a big number and with, a, with a title? And you're like, okay, again, you shrug your shoulders, you say, so what? As soon as you take that exact same visual and you add context, let's say a dial chart of some sort, it starts to give you that realization of saying 75% out of. Well, that could be good or bad. When you overlay that with a little bit more context, in this particular example, my area compared to the rest of Humana, well, now it's giving me context that I'm 75% out of 100, which by itself seems to be a good thing, but I'm falling behind everyone else. So now I, I understand a little bit more about the story. You add an additional element in its simplest form, which is, let's say, a 3% increase year over year. Now, that 75% is 3% more than last year. So I've actually improved. And even though I'm still 10% behind everyone else, it, this is really good for my area. I'm on an upward path of improvement. Next year, it'll probably be another 3%. Maybe it'll be 10. Who knows? But the bottom line is I have enough information now I, I have that meaningful insight. I have an actual opportunity to say we need to catch up to everyone else or no action because we're doing just fine. I have a story, and all I did was lay over a couple of simple contextual visualization techniques to say here's the meaning behind it. Here's your story. So you go from your so what on the left to your aha on the right. I love this, um, and I think that um, one of the things that we talk about a, a lot, we, we believe is a culture change for people, is data literacy. Um, we, we advocate for that a lot. You know, I think globally, the data literacy project um, that's underway is exciting, um, and I think this storytelling model kind of fits into the same thing, right? You're, you're trying to simplify the, those points. What, I, I want to remove their doubt and clarify any decisions that they need to make, right? Yeah. If I just present the thing on the left, gosh, I'm not sure I should take action on that one way or the other. Um, and how many times I, have we seen that? How many, 
How many yep. times have we seen just a table full of data, and that is our visualization? And then it takes minutes, if not hours, to f understand what I need to care about. And then we make the mistake of saying, well, green is good, red is bad. And that is our only visual cue to what to look at. But when you look at it in that sort of manner, you still have to spend cognitive time trying to figure out what's important. By doing this type of process and, and thinking in this sort of manner, you remove all of that as well. Does it take a little bit extra time? Yes, but it is meaningful and it's purposeful because at the end of the day, the consumption experience has been minimized and that's what we really need to care about. Not how much time it takes us to build something. I mean, yes, we want to cut that time down too, but ultimately we need to be focused on the consumer. What do they see? What do they get out of it? If we can put, continue to put ourselves in their shoes, what do you want to see is what I tell people. What would you want to see out of 75% your area? You're going to say, well, I want to see if that's good or bad. I want to see if it's up or down. I want to see how I'm doing compared to everyone else. So if you just kind of, you know, kind of extract yourself from a development position type of seat and put yourself in that business user, you find yourself asking the same questions ultimately that they'll ask. Fantastic, yeah, and I think it's that consumption. Uh, that's another thing I talk about all the time. Um, you know, when, when David talks about users consuming these things, I, I've looked at log files from Humana, and mm -hmm. you've got applications with 8,000 users using them. Like, like mm -hmm. the same app, 8,000 users are in there frequently, um, and that's adoption to me, right? Yeah. It's it's not do I got two people out of an entire organization doing it and then they got to get 55 phone calls every day because the others can't. Right. Um, so, I, right. so I think this really plays well with. And we've know, never think had about that kind the end of, user consuming it, right? Yeah, and we've never had that kind of adoption. Um, that Those tools that you're talking about that are heavily used, that have a lot of adoption, that have a lot of uh, positive feedback are ones that we worked on. Um, over the last four years since I've started engaging on these projects, you would have never seen that kind of engagement and adoption prior to. It just, you know, just a simple stated fact. So, um, yep. but and if nobody's I'll, I'll move patted on. you on the back, consider this my pat on the back. Yeah, well, <laughs> I mean, I, the, the reality is it, it just, it's fuel for my fire. It's saying this works. It's not saying that I'm right. I'm just, I'm not bringing anything that I invented to the table. I'm bringing experience from how I know people consume visual information to the table. Um, what I apply, you know, is actually based in a lot of other experts that did invent it, like the Gestalt School of uh, Visual Perception. You know, they came up with six fundamental ways after years of cognitive study and understanding how the human brain works. They came up with six points to say this is how people consume visual information. And so when you leverage that and you leverage a bunch of other experts like Alberto Cairo and Stroop and Tufti and Few and Tukey, you find that there's a lot of philosophy, a lot of human anatomy, a lot of understanding the cognitive uh, journey and how our brains work. It isn't about the tool. It's not about bar charts. It's about understanding how people consume and finding and using a tool and using visualization and using data to piece it together. Um, you know, I always feel like the best advertising is the kind that's subliminal or, or uh, subconscious. You don't know why you drive by McDonald's and crave their french fries. Well, their colors induce appetite the smell that they pump out makes you kind of in your subconscious mind want to pull over, right? And you can go across the gamut with commercial and corporate uh, marketing and advertising. They find these subconscious, subliminal, psychological ways to get you interested. Why are we not doing the same in our industry? So some of the considerations and reminders, definitely know your audience. 
consider the technology. Unfortunately, we live in 2018, moving into 2019. Things like displays, uh, desktop, you know, laptop, iPad, phone, it's all critical, it's all important. But the way that we process information on each of these uh, screen display sizes is, is critical. Um, you're not going to represent something the same way on a dashboard on a desktop as you are in a mobile device. Uh, plan for faster load times. How many times have we heard it's not fast enough? I don't, you know, this refresh time isn't fast enough. I'm not getting the information fast enough. Uh, there is no way that a dashboard should take, you know, 10 minutes to load the data. Uh, and we've had that scenario. So, uh, you know, that's just unrealistic of a user experience. Um, leverage the visual sweet spot. Um, I just came from a conference recently and they showed this wonderful visual. Uh, they actually hooked up a monitor out in the main lobby area um, to folks that could put on a headset and immediately they just had them visually consume the information. And after they collected that data, they showed that the visual sweet spot um, is like we know from a psychological perspective, in essentially the upper left area of the screen, right about here where I'm drawing the circle. Um, so obviously you want to leverage that. You want to put all of your most critical information uh, in the upper left. In our culture and society, we read left to right, top to bottom. So why not leverage that? Uh, limit the number of views and colors. Again, like I mentioned earlier, we, we almost feel like we need to put more color on there to draw more attention and make it interesting. But that is part of the Stroop effect in visual encoding. We don't, color needs to be purposeful. It needs to be a tool in our tool belt that we use to communicate the message. It should not be used as a free-for-all type of solution. The same with number of views. As I mentioned before, we always see a chart, a table, and a paragraph, all talking about the same data. Not necessary. Albert Einstein said it best. If you cannot say it simply, then you don't understand it. Find ways to understand it enough to then simplify. Add interactivity to encourage exploration. Um, there's nothing worse than seeing a number at an aggregated level and not knowing what's behind that number, and then you go to click on it to drill into it, and it doesn't do anything. Use that interactivity. Think about the best website that you've ever been on, the navigation, how you flow through it. Don't build and design these individual static views and call it a quote-unquote dashboard. It's meant to be interactive, to kind of ebb and flow flow via section and pages, but everything should connect and that experience should be seamless. If I go deep into something, I should be able to get back easily. I should be able to do it intuitively. We are, especially with the invent of the iPhone 11 years ago, we have become a culture of intuitive technology and intuitive exploration. It has to be easy to understand so that you don't have to explain it. And lastly, eliminate the clutter. Again, talking about too much stuff on a page, eliminate that clutter, get down to its simplicity. Um, and, and actually, lastly, lastly, <laughs> data to ink ratio. Edward Tufte was, was infamous for promoting this concept and idea. And it's simply put, make sure that whatever is on the page is meaningful. Make sure that the data comes through more than all the bells and whistles. Eliminate your drop shadows, eliminate the gradient blends, eliminate the outlines, eliminate or push back in a bar chart the, the, the accesses or the measurement lines. Uh, let the information come forward. If you try to muddy up the information with all this cool visual stuff, the message, it's going to take a lot longer for a consumer to get the message. One of the last slides that I have for you all is this, and I'll just fast forward through it to, to so you can see the whole thing. As Dalton mentioned, data literacy is critical for us. We're engaging uh, on a data literacy campaign. That is our future. Uh, data democratization is also very much something that we are working on uh, so that everyone in the enterprise has access to the same data uh, from kind of a single source methodology. 
data literacy is just a part of the whole. Um, when you look at some of the other petals in this flower, when, you, when you're going for rich, deep, meaningful insights, you need all of these components. The visual literacy and the data literacy are kind of what we've spoken about today a little bit. Um, but, you know, we, we have a way to go with some of these other uh, philosophies or methodologies. Um, you know, I try to deploy a lot of these in the work that I do, but I can't say that's true for everyone. Um, there's always something missing. And it's funny how we know something's missing, but we don't know what it is. You know, we were like, hmm, you know, my, the, the dashboard I just put out there, to Dalton's point, you know, isn't getting a lot of adoption. Why? Well, maybe it's because some one of these pieces is missing. Um, maybe it's we released it too fast. Maybe it's not the right visualization. Maybe it's not the right story. There could be a number of factors. But again, if you follow or at least you adopt a similar process to what we've instituted here, you'll find that there are a lot less questions. People feel good about it. People are like, wow, that was great. We just designed a dashboard recently for our senior leadership, uh, the president and CEO, as well as all of his direct reports. After we showed him all the mock-ups and we went through the whole process with him, and this is a man that has very little time, and we even brought him through this process. He could not say enough about it. But when we finally built and delivered this dashboard, he said, I need everything to feel this good. And it's because not only did we bring him on that journey of the design and build, and, and we kind of custom tailored it for what the story that they wanted out of it, but we also sat there and said, you know, we deployed all these principles. And they don't know why it works. They don't understand all of the science and technology, and they don't understand all of the cognitive aspects of it, but they feel good about it. They trust the data. They get it quickly and efficiently. And his immediate ask of me was, can we get all of our stuff to look and feel like this? Now, with that kind of feedback at that level, the fantastic news is now that message is coming from the top down. It not just gives us the support to do what we do, but it allows others to understand the level of importance of what we do. So I'm going to stop I, there. I love it. Yeah, and I can't think of a better way to end, David. That's, dude, I, I, loved, I, I loved the conversation and the way you ended it with, your CEO is saying, I want everything to feel this good. Um, yep. When I do presentations about storytelling, I usually start with, why in the world do us knuckleheads stand in line for hours to buy tickets for $20 um, to see a movie, pay $55 to get a large drink, a box of popcorn, and, and a candy bar, um, you know, to see things that we could end up watching, you know, uh, you know a few months later on Redbox. Yeah. Know, for buck fifty, and I, I think the reason is we're just suckers for a good story. We we want to feel, we want to be engaged, um, you know. And I think for those of you who've sat through this over hour now, um, you know, and we started out with really talking about the user interface and, and user experience, um, it is that storytelling piece, right? It's Stories get people engaged. It makes them emotional about what they're looking at. Um, one of the things that you mentioned was you want to get them engaged and you want it to be interactive so that they move through that. Mm -hmm. That that's what a story should do, right? It's it's we don't want them to make a decision based on looking at a number because uh, any knee jerk reaction there, there's not going to be any staying power. It's exactly. If you can make them feel that data and they've had to find that aha moment, they are going to be committed to seeing that thing through and getting the process fixed and making a change. And, and I can't think of anything more, more rewarding for me when I, when I did BI um, and now as I help organizations than seeing things actually get changed as a result of the work you did. Uh, that, that's what we're all hoping to do is have that kind of impact. 
What I'm sharing on screen supports that. This is the process, and we actually documented the process, and we share this with everyone. We start with our typical research. I don't care what you think you know you want. Nine times out of ten, it's not what you actually need. So we do, the, we do a little bit of extra research up front. We go off, we physically write, even if it's a, a, a bullet list. We sketch out pen on paper what the ideas are. We bring mock-ups together so that people understand digitally what this thing could actually look and feel like. And then we get into that traditional build and deliver model. But by actually documenting it and solidifying it, you get there. You get to where the people care about what you build and deliver. And it really is a game changer, especially for us in IT. Again, I have no IT exposure prior to this career, so I had no idea where the challenges were. So by bringing some light to this, you know, I think of this mountain, and I think about how difficult climbing Everest is, but when you get up at the top of Everest, you have this moment of analytical enlightenment of that sun rising across or above the clouds. We need to get there. And so the more we can share this journey and share this path and share the successes and spread the good word like you're doing, um, you know, I think we'll, we'll all be better off for it. And it's certainly exciting. The journey is exciting and the future is exciting. Absolutely, and I sure enjoy being on this journey with you, David. That's I that's value our partnership. Um, for those of you watching, um, I appreciate your time uh, and your support. Hopefully you've gotten something out of this and uh, sure look forward to uh, continuing to, to, you know, bring other smart people forward to you. Um, and if there's anything I can pick up at Holiday Inn Express to add to the conversation, I always enjoy doing that. David, I hope you have a great day. Get back to getting some real work done. <laughs> okay, and, we'll uh, do. We will certainly talk soon, my friend. All right. Thank you again.